tie goes in your favor. Um, it is up to you if you would like us to hear your case now or push it to next month. And you are muted. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. There we go. Yeah, you can hear it now. That's fine. All right, great. Thank you very much. All right. Thank and you. so everybody probably got a message that this is being recorded. So uh, my name is Mike Panessa. I am the chair of the Administrative Appeals Board. Uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, hereby call the regular meeting of the Administrative Appeals Board of March 23rd, 2022 to order. Uh, Board Secretary, could you please call the roll? Board Member Hedrick. Here. Uh, Board Member Moses. Here. Board Member Sinclair. He's muted, but he's here. Yeah. <laughs> Chair Panessa. Here. And we have members Basili and Kane absent. Okay. We knew uh, Vice Chair King was not going to be, or Kane, sorry, was not going to be here. Um, and uh, we'll proceed uh, with, as I mentioned, we do have a quorum with four. Um, and uh, just so we're clear, uh, Mr. Hedrick will be voting tonight. Um, all right, our first item um, on the agenda is the acceptance of the agenda. The board uh, can discuss and may amend the order of the agenda, uh, but I'd like to entertain a motion and a second for acceptance of the agenda. So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, board Secretary, could you please take the vote? Member Moses? Yes. Board Member Hedrick? Aye. Board Member Sinclair? He said aye. Chair Panessa? Aye. Motion carries 4 0. Thank you. Mr. Sinclair, you are muted, so we're assuming uh, we can understand you. Uh, all right, we're going to move on. Uh, next item is public comment. This time is set aside for members of the public to address the board on items of general interest within the subject matter jurisdiction of this board. The three minutes will be assigned to each speaker. Although the board values your comments, pursuant to the Brown Act, um, the board generally cannot take any action on any item not listed on the posted agenda. Testimony for hearings, will be taken at the time of each hearing. Uh, Board Secretary, could you please begin the public comment period? I have no registered speakers, but I do see that Mr. Hoban is in the room and has his hand raised. Uh, Mr. Hoban, you may begin. Hi, everybody. It's just a quick one. Uh, just to let you know, the City Council is going to start reviewing data about vacation rentals on March 29th in a working session. And I'm also asking you to uh, please make sure you have made some time and allowances to, um, sorry about that, hold on one second. Uh, make sure your previous recommendations to city council get consolidated and sent to them, okay? It doesn't have to be by next Wednesday, but you know your input would be needed there on your observations of what works and doesn't work. Thank you. Thank you. And Monique, can you uh, kind of make a note of that? Because I believe you have the various components that we have um, offered up over the last probably couple of years. Uh, uh, yes, I will make a note of that. Great, thank you very much. Uh, next item on the agenda is item number three. It is the appeal of a two-year suspension of the vacation rental registration certificate for the property located at 1350 South Farrell Drive and an administrative fine of $2,500. Uh, Board Secretary, could you please ensure that the city staff and the appellant understand that their testimony is under oath? City staff, appellants, and any other individual who desires to testify under this appeal hearing, under the laws of perjury, if you choose to speak, you hereby accept and acknowledge that your testimony shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Yes. Thank you. All right, at this time, uh, we'd like to have the staff present their report, please. Yes, good evening, um, Chair, Board members, uh, attendees on the call this evening. Uh, my name is Patrick Clifford with the Department of Special Program Compliance, and we oversee the vacation rental program here in the city of Palm Springs. 
The staff report uh, in front of you this evening is regarding a property located at 1350 South Farrell Drive here in Palm Springs. It was found that this property had received three violations within a 12 month period um, with the first citation issued on June 30th, 2021, a second citation issued on July 31st, 2021, and a third citation issued on October 9th, 2021. With that, pursuant to our municipal code, we did issue a letter of suspension for the vacation rental certificate for a period of two years. Uh, the code officers that did issue the citations are on this call this evening. Uh, code officer Wade is the code officer that issued the third citation that then set for the path of suspension, and he is available to give his testimony on the findings, and I'd like to offer him um, a chance to testify. Thanks. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Code Officer Dustin Wade for the City of Palm Springs. On October 17th, 2021 at 2.51 p.m., the Vacation Rental Hotline received a complaint regarding too many cars parked at the location. I arrived at the property at 3.02 p.m. and observed the property from the street in front of the location. A violation for the number of cars parked in the driveway was clearly observed. There were five cars parked in the property's driveway and the home is registered as a four bedroom allowing them four vehicles. I contacted the occupants and asked to speak with the responsible renter. After a few moments, the person identified as the responsible renter came to the door and I explained the complaint and my observations. I attempted to issue a citation to the responsible renter and was then advised that they were not there. I followed up with the local contact for the property and he stated that he would send the identification of the responsible renter to me via text. After a few hours, I texted the local contact because I hadn't received the ID and I never heard anything back from them. I issued administrative citation A6863 to the owner of the property and mailed it out to them for failure to obtain identification. This concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions. All right. Uh, thank you. Anything further from the city? Uh, nothing further from me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, why don't we go through the board for questions to the city? Uh, Mr. Hedrick, do you want to start? No questions. Thank you. Mr. Moses? No questions. Mr. Sinclair? Just one to the code officer. You indicated that you obviously gave the citation because uh, you couldn't get the identification. Is it also a violation or should there be a separate citation because there were five cars in the driveway? Because of prior what? I missed that last part. Is it one or two violations since the, the five cars in the driveway? Is that a separate violation? Uh, it would be. Um, it wasn't citable because I didn't have anybody to issue a citation to. Therefore, the citation for uh, failure to get identification went to the owner. All right, thank you. So, um, and I have a kind of a question re related to that. So had the, um, the uh, local contact gotten back to you with um, ID on that renter, the citation would have been for too many vehicles, correct? Correct, and issued to the responsible party. Okay. Um, and that's, is that one of those citations? We haven't had a lot of citations for cars. Is that one of the citations that actually goes to the renter, even though the house gets a strike? Correct. Yeah, it would go to the renter as a violation of the, the rules, basically. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I don't have any further questions. Um, at this time, I'd like to open the appeal hearing. The appellant is invited to speak for up to 10 minutes. Any members of the public who desire to speak on this appeal hearing shall have up to three minutes uh, to speak. If a member of the public testifies, the appellant will be given the provided a time for a rebuttal for up to two additional minutes. A board secretary, could you please begin the public testimony period? Okay. Um, my name is Chris Redaway. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate you uh, providing the opportunity for the appeal. Um, I, I sent through to the board. I'm not sure if you all received it. Um, I do have a copy of the renter's ID. 
um, when we had that violation. Uh, the point of order, what, did we swear the witnesses to? Yes, that happened already. I didn't hear it. It did. Sorry, go ahead, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, so we, I do have an ID present for that renter. Uh, the property manager that I had in place at the time has since been uh, let go and replaced by someone which we deem much more professional than what was in place at the time. Um, I, I do take full ownership for having a property manager in there that um, was learning some of the rules from the city perspective and, and actually didn't have my personal contact information on file because this was a VRBO rental. Uh, everything was documented, uh, driver's license on file, credit card on file, contact information on file for the renter. Um, but I did not know about that. Uh, I went through the property manager who obviously didn't follow through with me, um, even though I have the identification. Uh, and that's present in the evidence uh, submitted to each of you that you should have in front of you. Um, and then from a, a, a renter's perspective, um, once again, I, I've been very good about contacting and, and getting a hold of whoever is there. So if there is something that we need to do to make sure that we're abiding by city laws, we always want to be doing that. Um, this is my sole uh, extra vacation property. So I take this very seriously, keeping up with the rules and, and everything that we need to be doing to be a abiding citizen of the city of Palm Springs and also providing uh, everything that we need to to the city and staying within the, the codes and ordinances. Um, but I, I never heard from, from anyone during this time. I just ended up getting the citation, which is unfortunate because I feel like I could have fixed this very quickly um, as I had all contact information and ID information for the renter. Um, and I do take very seriously any noise violations or anything that happens at our residence. Um, so from a ID perspective, uh, I think it was Officer Wade. I, I think you said if, if the ID was present, and I could have gotten that to you, then there would have been a violation for the cars. If, if someone would have been able to get a hold of me and we could have had someone move those cars or, or reduce it down to four cars, would there still be a violation? Yeah, it, if we go there and we observe the violation, it's not like, a, it's not a correctable, so it would still be a violation. Okay. So, so from that perspective, then if you're saying that if there was an ID present and there would still be a violation, I mean, I. As far as from an explanation standpoint, what I can tell each of the board members here and anyone present on this phone is that we've taken extra measures to make sure that this would never ever happen again. In fact, we've, we've engaged Luxbox Agency. Um, we pay them a management fee to make sure that we've also installed decibel, uh, decibel noise alarms at the property, inside and outside the property. They have uh, extra surveillance on, on the property from a multiple people monitoring the property on a daily basis if someone is staying there, um, just so no one ever has a noise violation at this property ever again. Um, we've also increased the documentation that people have to sign when they actually rent the property, stating that there will be absolutely no noise outside of the property and even inside the property they need to stay below a certain decibel level. So that way it never even comes close to obtaining outside hearing um, so we've really upped our processes all the way around from a renting perspective um, to ensure to the city and anyone else from a neighboring perspective that we, we care about, we don't want to disturb them at all. And um, we, once again, this is, not a, um, this is not something that we take very lightly. Um, this is a, an income source for me and my family um, that I want to take very seriously and have taken very seriously. And unfortunately, um, you know, the property manager we had previously was a he was a designer and contractor of ours that I think it was his first foray into property management. And, and we found out pretty quickly, as you can see, a lot of these, um, these citations are pretty condensed into a, a couple month time frame. Um, he just wasn't on top of things. And so we, we had to learn and, and we figured that out and, and we understood that we needed to go in a different direction as soon as possible to make sure that, that we could set the right precedent for the future and, and not let this happen again. Um, the other thing that I will note, um, and I guess this is a question for the, the, the second citation that we have from a noise violation perspective, is that, is that the other officer that's on the line as well? Is it uh, Mr. Navin, Officer Navin? Um, my, my question for you, just from a documentation standpoint, I know you went to the property and it says you saw noise, but I noticed on item 327, there's no decibel readings taken. Did you take a decibel reading when you were there? Uh, Chair Pronounce, if it's appropriate to answer, um, is that all right? Go ahead. Sure. Um, so due to the timing of that 
particular complaint in my observation, it was a high traffic period coming through Farrell. As you know, that's a main uh, artery, artery thoroughfare in the city. Um, so I wasn't, able, I wasn't able to get uh, accurate decibel readings um, because of the vehicular traffic uh, throughout my observation period. Okay. So I guess my question for the board then is I understand that. I understand you're an officer and I've been observed, but if there is no evidence of an actual decibel violation, is there precedent for a citation there? So uh, if I can make a comment here, um, Officer Nab Nabhan, um, if you can comment on this. Um, when it comes to music, a decibel reading is not required. It is a, uh, a yes or a no. If they can hear music, it's an automatic citation. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, really, and that's a, that's a, a rule that is more uh, restrictive at vacation rental properties than it is uh, for a property that's not a registered vacation rental. Um, so. Yes, it's whether it's audible at the property line or not audible at the property line. We do the accompanying decibel readings is more of a point of reference uh, for informational purposes, but it doesn't uh, factor into whether or not a, a violation was observed or not. Got it. So I guess we could say that I guess the a noise violation like that is subjective in nature then to the person that's issuing the citation, correct? So you weren't issued a citation for a noise violation. You were issued a citation uh, for a violation of, of uh, the vacation rental ordinance 525070G, which is music audible at the property line. So they're, they're, uh, they're two separate things. Okay. Um, I mean, that, that's all that I have. I mean, I'm, I'm just looking at kind of the factual evidence that I have here. Once again, all I can say is that I, you know, I'm trying to be humble to the board here and let you know that I'm trying to do everything in my power to make sure that this never happens again. And I would hope that you grant us the ability to, to try to do that and make sure that we do it right and create obviously the right, you know, tax revenue and et cetera, that comes from the vacation property to go to the city. And uh, I am very happy to abide by every single rule possible there. And the measures that we've taken are above and beyond anything we had in place when these citations took place. And that's my commitment to the city. So I, I hope that we have the opportunity to, to continue this and, and do it the right way and make sure that we, we don't come back to this situation again. All right, anything further, Mr. Redaway? No, thank you. All right, so then uh, next will be, uh, um, actually board secretary, is there anyone from the public that wanted to speak on this case? I have no registered speakers and I see no hands. All right, thank you very much. Um, so uh, at this point, uh, we'll see if the board has any questions for the appellant. Why don't I go in reverse? Uh, Mr. Basili, I noticed uh, you have joined us. Um, were did. you uh, here for his uh, the entire testimony? Yes, I was. Okay, uh, and I'm gonna start with you and I realize you're driving, so um, obviously we want you to be careful. Um, did you have any questions for the appellant? No, no questions. Okay, um, Mr. Sinclair. Mr. Ottaway, you indicated that you finally figured out that your property manager was not competent. How long did you use that property management company? Uh, we had that property manager in place from approximately May of this last year until October when that third citation happened. So six months approximately. So when our, when our permit was originally issued, that's who we utilized because he was really the person that we knew in that place. I didn't have a lot of background with property management. And so as you, you know, that, yeah, you, hired that you hired that company simply because you knew them, not because you did, did a due diligence on our competency? No, I did the diligence. He said that he was very proficient in property management and that he had managed many properties before. And so we actually did a background check on him as well. And he had been in the real estate construction industry for a number of years and had talked to multiple sources of his as well from a referral standpoint that it said he had helped them with their properties previously. But as we got to find out over the course of a couple of months, I started, we started going through the process of having him check in people and dealing with, you know, things that people needed at the property. And it became apparent pretty quickly over the course of a few months that he did not know what he was doing in comparison to other firms that we had spoken with. Thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Moses. Any questions for the appellant? Not for the appellant. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hedrick. Do you know how many, uh, during the six months that you had this property manager, how many rentals you had during that period? 
I believe we had, I think we had 15 through okay. Airbnb and DRBO. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yes. Anything else, Mr. Hedrick? No, thank you, okay. sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, I have a couple of questions. So um, was this property manager with you from the very beginning? Yes. Okay, and who set up um, or who, I guess, did the application for your, um, for your permit? Uh, he helped me along with, I think, two of his assistants. Okay. He, when you say he helped you, does that mean you did it, but yes. they helped you? Okay. Yeah, he, he basically, we, we got together at my home, and he had said he had done these a number of times before, and so he helped me fill out the, the permit application. Okay. So on the, and I'm, I'm pretty familiar with this stuff, on the permit application, um, when you put his name, you made it that he was the contact for the city. Is that, uh, is that accurate? From that's, what I, that's what I've come to find out that I, I should not have been doing, right? With the, with the new property manager that we have, they are the primary contact, but my, my contact information, I mean, we haven't done short-term rentals, but we would have myself on there as an immediate contact that will handle anything. But I understand what you're saying. Yeah. So, and uh, yeah, so I guess, yes. Yeah. Thank you. My, my point is that um, you chose to have him as the contact. Now I understand the city requires a local contact for incidents, but um, it was that property manager that you chose. So I guess uh, I'm responding to your testimony that um, the city didn't reach out to you when in fact you asked the city to reach out to your property manager. Um, then my next, my other question is, um, so you uh, testified that you had made a whole uh, variety of changes um, to try to not have situations like this uh, happen. Um, is it fair to say that all these changes came after the citations? We started doing them after the, after the second citation because we had a month period where we had that first citation from a noise violation perspective and, and we had multiple conversations with the property manager about setting the right precedent in, before anyone ever showed up in text message conversation, phone conversation through VRBO and Airbnb. So it was all documented. And we thought we had nipped that in the bud. Um, but obviously we got that second violation on July 31st. And so after that, we started putting measures into place even further beyond with, you know, a noise decibel alarm, um, and then actually making sure that we had more constant contact with the renter that was in place um, and actually having a document that stated all of the different rules associated with staying at the property, including cars. And that was supposed to be presented to the renter um, upon check-in and check-out. And so we, we made an additional process. I actually paid quite a bit through a, through a lawyer here locally um, to produce a document that people would have to sign as a renting perspective as an additional check and balance above and beyond what they were doing through Airbnb and VRBO. So I was doing that prior. Um, and then that third violation around the cars came. And I'm not sure why that happened because we, we tried to take extra procedures to make sure that that never happened. Um, and I, I can't speak for the property manager. All I can tell you is that he's no longer working for us and with us uh, because of these reasons. And we feel that he didn't follow through on his commitment to do those things. Okay. And I guess, you know, uh, just a little commentary on my part, um, you can go through all of this effort um, and sometimes guests still don't care. Um, and unfortunately the homeowner, sure. the permit holder uh, pays the price for that. I agree. Um, I can tell you another thing, just, I guess, to add to that, um, just things that you learn um, because this was our first foray into it. Um, you know, the property manager originally, you know, he was telling us, you know, we should be doing, you know, two-day rentals, three-day rentals. I've come to find out that I think you do that, you attract the, right, the wrong crowd, right? And so we've actually switched to at least a five to seven day minimum if we were to do this again, probably more like a seven day and get people that actually are coming there to enjoy the area and the property and not just coming there to party, right? And I, I think that's another thing that we learned as well that is going to be part of our further going process if, if allowed the ability to. Okay. Uh, any uh, board members, any uh, questions for uh, Mr. Hedrick, please? Ms. Tremway, uh, uh, well, first for the uh, Helen, how many bedrooms does this have? Uh, there are four bedrooms. So it's, you're allowed to have 10 people, correct? 
Yeah, there's there's one. I mean, I think, yeah, we have four bedrooms. One, two, three. Casita, yeah, correct. So, Ms. Tremway, uh, I it it's my understanding that during the day you're allowed to have a certain number of extra people. Is that correct? Actually, you know what? This might be uh, better uh, for Patrick okay, or for, for one of the officers to answer. Yeah, I can uh, have, uh, be happy to answer that. Uh, yeah. Yes, you are allowed additional um, people during the day, additional four. Um, in this case, it's a four bedroom. So uh, there's allowed to be um, two guests per bedroom for overnight and an additional four during the day. That's not including um, two children that are under the age of as 12 or 13, I'd have to look it up, but minor children. Um, but yeah, you can have four additional guests during the day. So with that, but there's no provision for vehicles for those four guests during the day? There's not municipal code, just says one car per bedroom. Okay, thank you. All right, um, thank you. Um, so uh, does the city have any additional testimony? Mr. Moses, are you? Well, I had a question for Ms. Tremblay as well. We have found that the statutes involved in this, or whatever you call them, are very rigid and that we don't have a lot of discretion. Do we have any discretion in this situation? I'm not, can you be more specific? I mean, what do you, what are you taking issue with with the third citation? Do we have the discretion to say, well, they had a, a uh, an agent who uh, didn't perform, uh, and they didn't. It's not their fault that they had a, a you know. Can we say that? I don't so, think. Yeah. Can uh, I um, can I actually um, ask you? Let's. It's a good question, and I don't want to lose it. But let's save that until um, after the testimony and a part of our discussion. But it's a, I think it's a good question and I don't want to lose it. Uh, so at this point, uh, does the city have any response to uh, the testimony that was presented? Uh, no further response, thanks. All right, thank you. So then at that point, at this point, uh, we will close the open discussion part of the appeal. Um, and now this is the time for the board members to discuss. And now let's uh, go to Mr. Moses's question. So my question, again, to restate it simply, is do we have any discretion? It is clear there was a violation. Do we have any discretion to forgive it? Well, the municipal code, and I found this section, it's 5.25.050 on agency, subsection A. And that really holds the owner responsible for everything, like the buck stops at the owner, um, even if there is an agent. Um, the fail, it actually says the failure of an agent to comply with this chapter shall not relieve the owner or the owner's obligations under the provisions of the chapter. So the city wanted the, the owner to be ultimately responsible. And then, you know, perhaps there could be some sort of civil action between the owner and the property management company, a breach of contract issue or, or something like that. But the city wanted, um, ultimately to have the owner responsible. Okay, thank you. All right, um, so uh, discussion amongst the board. Why don't we start with Mr. Hedrick? <clears throat> well, I, I'm not sure what we can do, so I'm gonna pass and listen to the others. Okay, uh, Mr. Moses, any other well, uh, discussion I, for the board? I think that, yeah, well, just my discussion is that I think that doesn't leave us the discretion we would need to overturn the ruling of the previous. Mr. Sinclair? No, I agree with Mr. Moses. And we've had, we've come up with, in, we've, this has confronted us before, and it's always the same conclusion. It's the, it's the homeowner's responsibility to ensure that the property manager is doing their job. Mr. Basili, I I also agree with uh, the statement that was just made as well. I think it's ultimately the homeowner, unfortunately, that uh, has to bear the consequences. Okay, um, it sounds yeah like you know the the discussion anyway is that 
Um, and we, like Mr. Sinclair has said, we have been in this position many times where a property manager is really not doing their job um, to the point of, you know, I guess it's subjective whether or not it's negligent, but, but a property manager not doing their job, that onus still falls on the homeowner. Um, unless uh, any board member has any other comments for discussion, um, uh, I'd like to entertain a motion. I move we uphold the, the administrative action against and the penalty because of... Is there a second? Second. Board Secretary, could you call the vote, please? Board Member Moses. Here, I mean, <laughs> in favor. Board Member Sinclair. Four. Board Member Basili. Four. Board Member Hedrick. Aye. Chair Panessa. Aye. Motion carries 5-0 to uphold the decision. Uh, so Mr. Redaway, um, the board obviously uh, upheld the fine and suspension. You'll get official notification from the city um, this does not prevent you from running the house on what the city defines as long-term, so greater than 28 nights, um, but for the period of the suspension, uh, short-term will be prohibited. Um, thank you everyone for your time on this case. Uh, we're going to move on to the next case, and that is um, the appeal of a two-year suspension of the vacation rental registration certificate for the property at 2825 East Verona Road. Um, and the administrative fine of $2,500. Board Secretary, could you please ensure that the city staff and the appellant understand that their testimony is under oath? City staff, appellants, and any other individual who desires to speak or to testify under this appeal hearing, under the laws of perjury, if you choose to speak, you hereby accept and acknowledge that your testimony shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And when it is your turn, please begin your testimony by stating your name. I do. I do. Great. At this time, um, I would like to ask for the staff report. Yes, good evening. Thank you, Chair, Board members, attendees on the call this evening. My name is Patrick Clifford with the Department of Special Program Compliance. Uh, we oversee the vacation rental program here in the city of Palm Springs. And before you this evening is a staff report uh, regarding property located at 2825 East Verona Road here in Palm Springs. It was found that this property attained three citations or violations within a 12 month period. Uh, the first uh, violation on June 20th, 2021, the second violation on September 13th, 2021, and a third citation on the same date, September 13th, 2021, uh, for failing to submit contract summaries. Uh, also, the code officer that issued the second and third citation is on the call this evening to pro provide testimony, and I would uh, ask that he um, provides a testimony at this time. Thank you. Uh, so good evening, members of the board, fellow city staff, and members of the public joining us for tonight's hearing. Uh, my name is Mitch Navhan, and I'm a code compliance officer for the city of Palm Springs. Uh, so there were two separate citations issued as a result of my response on September 13th, 2021, uh, one that went to the renters and one uh, that was subsequently issued to uh, the property owner. So those were citations uh, three and two. Uh, so the details related to the citation for music uh, that went to the renters, which was citation number two, is as follows. Uh, on Monday, September 13th, 2021, the City of Palm Springs 24-hour vacation rental hotline received a complaint for loud music at the vacation rental property located at 2825 East Verona Road. As the primary vacation rental enforcement officer on duty, I was dispatched on the call at 1.34 in the afternoon. Uh, I arrived at the property at 1.58 p.m., where from the street in front of the property, a violation for music amplified beyond the property line was observed. Uh, in addition to being able to clearly identify the source of the music, the song being played uh, was also identified using my department issued mobile cellular device uh, and was documented in my report included in attachment five as item 426, which has been redacted. 
Uh, I contacted the occupants at the front door and briefly discussed the com uh, complaint that was received and the observed violation with the renters. Uh, the identified responsible renter stated that they were told uh, that they could listen to music as long as they kept the volume low. Uh, I issued the guests a good neighbor brochure and briefly discussed the contents within related to the rules of vacation rental properties. Uh, I also educated the guests on the specifics related to the rules for music and the rules for noise in general. Uh, I then issued the citation for music and advised the guests uh, that further observed violations could result in the issuance of additional citations. Uh, so related to the citation that was issued to the property owner for failure to submit a contract summary, uh, prior to my response to the complaint for music at the property, I conducted a brief search to the city's uh, cloud-based record keeping database and was unable to locate a submitted contract summary. Uh, while contacting the guests at the property in response to my observations, the occupants stated that they had booked the property for a short-term stay, arriving on Sunday, September 12th, 2021, and departing on Tuesday, September 14th, 2021, uh, via the booking website Airbnb. A second more detailed check for a submitted contract summary was conducted upon arrival back at my workstation after completing my response to the call and found that uh, there was no contract summary on file for the current guest stay. Uh, so I know this has come up a few times in the last few meetings, but to detail a little bit about how I search for a contract summary, um, the brief search uh, before my response, obviously time is of the essence whenever we get a complaint and the city's goal is to respond in person within 30 minutes. Um, so there's a couple different search values that we search for when we're going through the search window of uh, the website that we utilize to, to, uh, for our contract summary uh, files. So the first search by uh, the address is a street number address. Uh, and if that doesn't yield any results, I then revert to the, the city ID, which is unique to every property. As you know, some properties share the same numerical address. Um, and so the, that's why uh, the second search that's done is done with the city ID, which is unique to each individual property. Um, the, the search functionality is not the greatest. So that's why we don't always base those citations based off of that brief search. Um, the second more detailed uh, search happens when uh, we actually download all of the available submitted contract summaries and it uh, downloads them in bunches of 10,000 submissions. Um, and so it breaks it up into multiple Excel files. And through that, we can open the data in Excel and filter out through specific addresses and we can see the record of submissions. Um, so that's the, the more detailed search that we do. And then obviously we go back, um, I go back for the entire year. Uh, so sometimes that's filtering through, you know, many thousands of submissions because it's every single registered vacation rental property that has submitted uh, a contract summary for their stay. Um, so just wanted to kind of provide that to you. I know I've, I've, I touch on it, um, in, in my narratives, but that's just to kind of give you some more information related to that. So uh, that'll conclude what I have to present and I am available to answer any related questions that uh, any of the board members may have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we'll open it up to questions from the board uh, to the city staff. Why don't we start with Mr. Hedrick? No questions, thank you. Mr. Moses? No questions. Mr. Sinclair? No questions. And Mr. Basili? No questions right now. So um, I just have, uh, I think one. Um, so looking at the information we were provided, that third, um, it looks like uh, the city reached out to this uh, homeowner a couple of times about contract summaries. Is that accurate? Uh, yes, Chair, I can answer that. Uh... Well, the first uh, interaction really comes from our application where they initial and um, they acknowledge that contract summaries have to be submitted, as well as the kind of like welcome email that our staff sends when we, we uh, grant them you know, permission to start operating, which shows the link of the tool where to go to submit contract summaries. Additionally, though, we did um, on a letter dated August 4th, 2021, which is attachment nine in your packet, um, identified that this property did not submit a contract summary for the month of um, April 2020, I believe, and we sent them a, um, a, a specific letter um, addressed to them, um, noting that no contract summaries were submitted um, for 
uh, April 2021. My apologies if I said 2020, April 2021. Uh, so this was found that this property did not submit contracts. Some reason this was a, a, a specific email to the property owner themselves. And so um, included with that letter provided that it, we pull up a contract summary history and it does look there, like there was a response to that letter um, because a contract summary was submitted on August 23rd, 2021 for a stay in the month of April. Um, and so we wanted to provide it. It does look like there was a response with that letter that was mailed out. So uh, there was a contract submitted retroactively? Yes, so for when we um, send out these letters, uh, we found uh, what we do is we do an um, overall audit of the property profiles. And then if we find it here in the office, um, we do um, allow them to go and uh, basically retroactively submit the contract summaries that we think are missing. And so our property files can be updated and reflected accordingly. And so for that month you were describing that there was no contract summary submitted, was there TOT paid for that month? That's correct. Um, that's one of the measures that we use to know that there was short-term rental occurring that month. And then um, finally, um, when you allow an owner to retroactively uh, submit contract summaries, that's kind of a unique thing you do on a one-off basis. Is that correct? Because that's not available to the general population of per uh, permit holders. That's correct. And it's simply because we're doing an audit and we want them, everyone's profile to be uh, reflective of the situ of their um, activity. All right. Uh, thank you. I don't have any further questions. If there is no more questions from the board, um, at this time, I'd like to open the appeal hearing. Uh, the appellant is invited to speak for up to 10 minutes. Any member of the public who desires to speak on this appeal hearing shall have up to three minutes. If a member of the public chooses to speak on this appeal hearing, the appellant will have the opportunity for a rebuttal for up to two additional minutes. Board Secretary, can you please begin the public testimony period? Chair Panessa, I have no registered speakers, but it does look like the appellant is in the room. So if you'd like to give testimony, please begin now. Uh, hi, hello. Hello. Yeah. Go ahead, please. My name is my name is Manel. I'm I'm here as a representative of the owner. Um, I'm also the property manager of the property. So yeah, I think that we had an issue with the um, well, basically two issues, right? The the first one is the the situation with the fines for the for the noise and the disturbance, right? That we um we change uh, everything after that. After this happens, we take two measurements and we added some things in the house like noise aware, noise detectors and cameras and, and, you know, we did some measurements in the house and also we changed the property manager because we had some, uh, I think a misunderstanding or something happens with the, with the contract summarized. So this is the, the, second, the second part of the, of the, Situation and then we we also have a legal department uh, dealing with this contract summarized right now and and making sure that this is not happening again. But I think that there was something you know that uh, that some emails or something happens with the owner, which is Joseba, that uh, never went through uh, in regards to the contract summarized or something like that. So there was something uh, you know that happens with this. Uh, I'm anything further? Do you have anything additional uh, in your testimony? Um, no, uh, as far as, I, as, far as uh, we change now, again, uh, I submit a, a noise, um, basically a plan that we made right now. So right now we are managing like, um, as a company, I'm managing like uh, 15 properties around California, right? Big Bear, Joshua Tree, also in Miami. So basically we have two property managers uh, during all day, like 24 hours, monitoring uh, all the noises, all the, we have noise detectors in all the houses, right? 
So in order to make sure that there is no parties, there is no disturbances to the neighbors right now, we have like two uh, noise detectors in each house, one indoor and one outdoor. And we are constantly monitorizing uh, the noises in the houses as well cameras, right? To making sure that, you know, there is no more than, than the guests that we authorize it. And then also um, with these two property managers that, that we have right now, 24 hours, we make sure that check, uh, we can check all the reservations. We, we don't accept one day, reserv one day uh, reservation or last minute reservations in order to avoid these kind of parties and also always uh, making sure that the, the guests are more than 21 years and, and you know, all the occupants have good reviews in their profiles. And, you know, we make sure that uh, we don't bother anyone in the neighbors because for, for us, uh, you know, it's super important to, to uh, you know, keep the, the, the calm in the neighbor and don't bother no one around. So that's something that I really want to, you know, um, to, to bring here that we change everything in this house and uh, you know we are not gonna allow this happens again for sure. All right, uh, thank you. Is uh, and um, I don't want to cut you off. Is that sorry? Is, uh, anything additional? No. Okay, so uh, at this point we'll open it up to questions from the board uh, to the appellant. Um, why don't we start with Mr. Basili? Chair Panosa, before yes. you on, I do see a hand raised. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Leslie, if, if you'd like to provide comments. Ms. Benjamin, if you want, uh, you have three minutes. Uh, yes, actually, I'm an attorney representing the homeowner. So, um, yeah, I mean, Mr. Alguacil laid out pretty much a lot of the main factual points that we wanted to address with the board here today. Uh, as far as the noise, we completely understand the city's very valid concerns on that issue. Uh, to that effect, I submitted a um, nuisance uh, prevention plan that um, was submitted to the board last week. In that, we detailed the changes that the owner has made to deal with noise problems, specifically um, noise detectors operated by NoiseAware. These are programmed to have uh, various thresholds throughout the day which can be adjusted as needed. Uh, furthermore, because uh, the property owner is not always physically present here in the Valley, uh, we have local property management that is available 24 seven to address issues immediately before the city would have to get involved ideally. And furthermore, we also made some changes to the lease agreement and that addendum was provided to the board as well, uh, stating specifically that violation of the noise ordinance here in Palm Springs would be grounds for immediate eviction. Uh, as to the issue of contract summaries, uh, I believe Mr. Alguacil can talk in more detail about this factually, but it's my understanding that I believe my client was actually in Spain at some point in the summer. And that, that was one of the reasons that he was not able to um, respond to that as um, expeditiously as he would have liked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. Exactly. Exactly. So there was something, you know, uh, something missing with some, you know, something in the email or something. He was in the plane and he was flying to Spain and something happens. And that's why it didn't go in through the, the email or something. Yeah. Uh, all right. Thank you. Uh, anything additional? Uh, not at this time. And as I said, even though uh, my client is not physically here with us today, between myself and uh, Mr. Aguasil, we should be able to answer any factual questions that the board may have. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, so at this point, um, we will open it up to the board to ask questions uh, of the appellant. Um, and why don't I start with Mr. Basili? Uh, I don't have any questions right now. Uh, Mr. Sinclair. My question would be the fact that you're out of town, you didn't make any provision with your property manager or anyone else, your attorney, to make sure those, pro those uh, summaries were submitted? I should clarify, I was not uh, retained by Mr. Correo Perriero at that time. I do not know if he had legal counsel at that time. I don't think that matters. I just wonder 
whether he tried to make any any provision at all to cover this while he was out of the country. I understand, Mr. Sinclair. I just wanted to clarify as far as okay. uh, attorneys uh, with your question. Mr. Alguacil, mm -hmm. go ahead. No, no, yeah, yeah. Uh, the thing is that uh, Joseba was pretty new in, in all this, um, you know, um, as, as with this property and, and, you know, it was a, a pretty new matter for him. So he was, you know, he was pretty new in this and then, you know, he learned and, and now that's why he has, you know, uh, legal department and, and everything dealing with this right now. That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Moses? Uh, not as a question, I have a discussion item. All right, we'll save that for discussion time. Uh, Mr. Hedrick? Uh, no questions, thank you. So um, I just wanna make sure I understand. So uh, Mr. Aguasil, you are the property manager, not the owner, is that correct? That is correct, yeah. Okay, and as the property manager, uh, when did you uh, start managing this property? like around six, seven months ago. Okay, so were you managing it when uh, they received the citation for in September uh, for the contract summaries? Uh, no, at this moment. So, I mean, I was not involved in this property. I, I work for the owner doing other things, but I was, I was helping him with some things, but I was not dealing with the property full time. So like, who, like who was managing the property then at that time? Uh, he had uh, someone like his assistant and, and she was dealing with, with everything. Okay. And so whose role was it? Was it then and whose role is it now to submit contract summaries? You mean her assistant, his assistant? or I, I'm asking. I'm not, I, I don't know. That's why I'm asking who... Who is responsible for submitting the contract summaries? Well, we have someone, someone else that is gonna basically work full time. Uh, like we have a legal department which is gonna be dealing with this matter from moving forward, right now. Okay, so at that point, there was nobody. Is am I understanding correctly? Yeah, he was nobody that that was in charge of uh, kind of meeting all of the city's various requirements exactly as i said uh it was a you know pretty new situation for for joseba and uh you know he's he has now uh, someone full-time dealing with these matters okay thank you um, that's all i had um uh, does the city have any rebuttal to the testimony that was presented Uh, nothing further, um, Chair. I was looking up uh, maybe to help answer the questions of who was what we have on file as a local contact at that time. I do have that available if you're interested in that. Um, uh, but if not, um, you know, I'll be happy to share if you are. Um, sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so the local contact that we have on file um, is um, a Jorge Araga and Ana Gomez. Uh, and that's current as of today. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, if there is no more questions for the appellant, uh, we will close the um, ap appeal hearing. And at this point, it is a discussion time for the board. Uh, Mr. Moses, do you wanna go first? Yeah, all of this testimony is what's happened after the fact. Uh, we've heard no testimony from anyone, if I understand it correctly, who was, involved with any responsibility when these violations occur. Therefore, I'm prepared to move for the support of the uh, penalty and the, uh, the resolution of it. Okay, uh, Mr. Hedrick, any discussion? Uh, I agree with Mr. Moses. Mr. Sinclair? No, I agree. The barn door was open and you can't close it after everything's gone out. Okay, Mr. Vasily? I agree with Mr. Moses as well. I so, didn't um, that many people agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess, you know, from my perspective is, you know, the city goes through some 
pretty um, great pains to make sure you know there's a, a local person, there's somebody responsible. They make the whoever's applying for the permit initial all of these places that they know what the requirements are. Um, it's disturbing to me that there was nobody, the owner had nobody in place to um, take care of these and had multiple notices, uh, no contract summaries. And, you know, we have been through this before. That is pretty serious um, uh, to the city's compliance department. So, um, all right, is there, uh, unless anybody else on the board has um, any other discussion points, uh, does someone want to make a motion in a second? I Second. Okay, uh, Board Secretary, can you please call the vote? I'm sorry, I missed the motion with that, Sinclair. No. no. Uh, Mr. Moses, can you repeat your motion? Your please? My motion is to uphold the uh, resolution, to adopt the resolution upholding the administrative citation. <coughs> Got it. And the second was Hedrick? No, no Sinclair. 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 Okay, Board Member Moses. Aye. Board Member Sinclair. Aye. Board Member Hedrick. Aye. Board Member Vasili. Aye. Chair Panessa. Aye. Motion carries 5-0 to uphold the administrative decision. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Agusil, that what just happened was the uh, board voted to uphold the fine and suspension um, you'll get official notification or whoever the local, the contact is that the city has will get official notification from the city. Um, so there'll be a two year suspension in short term rentals that does not preclude them from doing uh, what is a long term rental from the city's definition. Um, but the board has upheld, upheld the suspension. So I want to thank everybody for your time and efforts. Um, we're going to move on to the next uh, item. Um, and this is an item, uh, I'm sorry, this portion of the meeting is set aside for general comments, announcements, requests of the staff and or other issues of concern from the members of the Administrative Appeals Board. Does anybody have anything? No. Doesn't look like it. All right. Um, at next on the item is the an update from the city attorney. Jill, do you have anything for us? I don't have anything either. All right, thank you. And finally, um, it's time set aside for the city clerk for any updates. Uh, no updates, your meeting, next meeting is April 27th. We do have two cases set aside for that day. Um, and then our backlog is completely caught up with the exception of a couple that need some legal clarification. Um, and that's all I have. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I must say again? Motion to adjourn. <laughs> All right. I was going to ask, is there a motion to adjourn? Second. All right. I see a second. I always forget if we need to vote on that or if we just go. <laughs> you don't, don't, you don't need a second to adjourn. Looks like everyone's agreeable. All right. Thank you, everyone. And we will see you, see you next time. Stay well. Thank you. Yeah.